ham radio operating modes. What do we do on this radio stuff anyway? Um, and there's some things, some, some modes people have heard about, I'm sure, and other modes maybe not so much, um, and somewhere in between. So let's take a look at a few of them. First of all, let's look at radio. Radio, which is what we're all using here, was developed you know, in, the, in the end of the 19, uh, or 1800s. And originally, it was used for you know, scientific and uh, uh, commercial purposes. One of the most important ones was used to contact and communicate with ships at sea, like the Titanic. Now, everybody, you know, you understand where it would be a good idea to be able to send messages to a ship at sea for safety of life, uh, rescue, like SOS, Mayday, and, you know, like that. But the thing that drove it more was the commercial use of commodities brokers, coal shippers, grain shippers, shipping agents, wanting to let their agents in New York know that the ship coming from Liverpool is going to be there in two days. So they can be ready to offload. And that, that commercial, that commerce, that business information was the driving force between, or the driving force for, or for radio communications to begin with. Now, it didn't take long until there was hobbyists doing it. Didn't surprise anybody, right? No matter what anything does, there's somebody, somebody wants to do it as a hobby. And before long, we had amateur radio operators. In fact, the first club, the first amateur radio club, was formed at Columbia University in 1908. Now, it goes back well over 100 years. And, and the purpose of amateur radio, according to the FCC, in addition to emergency communications and stuff like we're kind of doing here, is to advance the state of the radio art. And there was a lot of, you know, a lot of ham radio operators back in the early days actually pioneered some of the concepts of radio communications. And still today, these digital modes that people are using, a lot of them were pioneered by ham radio operators. And I'll mention some of them here a little bit later. Now the first one we're gonna talk about is CW, or continuous wave. And I've always had a problem with that term because continuous wave kind of implies that the signal is going to be continuous. Well, it's not. It's kind of broken up into dots and dashes. And, well, that's not continuous. But they called it continuous wave because the signal being sent, instead of being modulated and having voice information or some other type of information on it, changing frequency, all it did was send a wave. So they called it continuous wave, even though I still have a problem with that, with that term. Um, and radio operators started using the Morse code kind of right away, and Samuel Morse had developed the Morse code way back in 1837 for land-based telegraph. Remember the old Western movies where the guys had the telegraph operators? They used that code Instead of sending it by radio, it was current going through those long wires that went across the across the desert and stuff on those on those poles. Um, so they used the Morse code way, even way back then. The Morse code uses dots and dashes or longs and shorts. We call them dits or dots uh, to encode characters into a form that can be sent over the radio. There's a, the Morse code. Now, I don't expect you all to memorize that in the few seconds we're going to be showing it up here. But one thing to notice that even way back in the mid 1800s, Samuel Morse was smart enough to say, "All right, the letter, the English letters that we use most in written English, let's make them the shortest." So A E I O is kind of a little out, outlier there. S are kind of the shortest symbol. E is the shortest, just a dit. And that's the most used letter in the English alphabet, in the English language. T is another one, so it's just a dash, a da. And again, the, the letters that aren't used very much, like Y and Z, are the are the longest ones. Q is another one that's a, a long, a long one, da 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 da. The numbers, you can see the pattern there. One one dot. And then four dashes for a for a one, and then two for a two, three for a three, and then you get the six flips, one dash and four dots. 
So that, you know, that's kind of a systematic, kind of easy thing to visualize. Yeah, just for good, that's what you said Morse code on. That's called the Morse code key. That particular one is a uh, World War II J38 signal port key. And when we go over later to my 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 ham radio, my go station over here, you'll see that's the one that's hooked up to my radio. That's the one I normally use uh, when I do CW. Now, that's an Army one. We don't want to leave out the Navy, because I'm sure there's some Navy people around. The Navy has a Morse code key, too. That's a World War II shipboard key. It's called explosion proof, because it was designed to be you know, used on a ship, a warship, where you might have gasoline fumes or fuel fumes in the area. So the contacts, the, the actual contacts, the switch contacts that close that might spark, they're all enclosed inside the body of the inside the body of the key, so they cannot ignite any fuel vapors or anything around. And that was called a flame proof or explosion proof key, and I just happen to have that one over there on that table too. If you want to take a look at it. Nowadays, since about the 50s and 60s, they had electronic circuits that, instead of well, let me let me let me back up a, a step here. With that kind of key, even the old telegraphers found out in the, in the old, old days that you know where carpal tunnel syndrome was invented? It wasn't with keyboards. It was with guys spending all day tapping out code on one of those keys. And they, they came to come to find out that, you know what? It's a lot less stressful to just put your hand on, a, on a, you know, an arm on a desk and push your fingers left and right. So they. They have an electronic box now that has you know, circuitry in it. So that's called a paddle. And you push on the side with your thumb, and it'll go dit, 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 it'll do continuous dits. And you push your finger on the other side, and it goes da, 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 until you stop. So if you want to send a dit, da, you go dit, da. Or da, da, dit, da, da, dit, da. So it's just two fingers going back and forth instead of the up and down motion. That's the way most hams do it now. I don't. I never. I, I learned it the old-fashioned way back in the 50s and 60s, and I just I've never been able to get the hang of one of these. I do it the old way. So you know, CW is the oldest mode. It's still in use. You can go over here and hear some on the on my radio over there. Um, and until 2006, you were required send and receive Morse code at certain speeds to get a ham radio license. Um, it caused a lot of consternation for a lot of folks. And so in, in 2006, the world community, the world radio community said, okay, we're going to drop that requirement. We no longer need to show proficiency in Morse code to get a ham radio license. But there's still people that use it. Because just like in anything else, you've got a PC and autos who want to you know, let's do it the old way. Why do people rebuild old cars? Well, because they're old. You know. Same thing with Morse code. Well, it was good enough then. And CW will get a message through even when noise, atmospheric conditions, and everything's going to pot. The human brain can, can discern a signal and figure out the intelligence in it better than a computer in most cases. Well, there's some exceptions to that. But when all else fails, Morse code will get, get a message through. Like voice won't, won't do it. Okay, so when we think of radio, talking on the radio, what do we normally think of? Voice, right? Talking. Okay, well, that came around in the 1930s. And AM, amplitude modulation, was first. I don't know, you might, you might be... Well, there's some people here young enough to, that probably don't remember AM radio, um, but there used to be a thing called AM radio, amplitude modulation, that kind of kind of going away in a lot of a lot of markets, replaced by FM, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it was there, but it was replaced in the 50s by another system. It's a, a type of modulation called single sideband suppressed carrier. The old AM system and distributed a lot of energy across the band of frequencies. But it was double. The same information was sent twice in two different spatial positions. And I just figured out, well, we only need one of those. The other one's superfluous, is that the right word? Superfluous? Um, 
So they devised circuitry to get rid of one of the sidebands and came up with a single sideband, which is more efficient. And it had this thing old carrier in there that was left over and said, you know what, we don't need that carrier anymore either. So we're going to take that out. And that'll save us some more power and efficiency. So they came up with single side hands, press carrier. That's what almost all hands use on the air now. When you hear people talking on these radios, it's going to be single side bands, press carrier. I'm the high frequency bands, the shortwave bands, the ones that go around the world. Local police fire scanner stuff, that's a little different. We're going to talk about that. Next, frequency modulation. Everybody knows FM stations, right? FM 103.5. They use a, a system of modulation where your voice actually moves the frequency up and down. It modulates the frequency. They call it frequency modulation. It's usually used on the higher frequencies. You'll notice on your radio, AM stations are down here at 580 and 1020, whereas your FM stations are up at 93 megahertz or 88 megahertz up, up there. So it's a much higher frequency. It's more efficient up there. So FM works really good, but on those frequencies, it's pretty much dependent on line of sight. These guys you see running around with the little handy talkies and the police and the fire, they got their, their little handy talkie radios. They can only send about as far as they can see. Now you can see to a mountaintop, it'll send that far. Actually, if you can see to a satellite, it would go that far. But it won't go over mountains, it doesn't go through buildings very well. It's a kind of a line of sight system. So what we do is we have repeaters. And a repeater is just a radio that's up on a mountaintop and it just sits there and if it hears a signal from somebody with a, a walkie-talkie, handy talkie walking around, police, fire, anybody, us, ham radio operators, and you're talking, that radio up on the mountain, since it sits up on a mountain, it can see a long way, it hears that signal and it sends it back on another frequency nearby and sends it back down to a radio or a car driving around. So it repeats the signal and now the line of sight is the line of sight from the system that's up on that mountain rather than down where you are. Works much, much, much better. And that's the predominant form of communications for emergency services in a local in a local area within a city or town or that kind of thing. This is an example, but but wherever he is, came up with this map. This shows where the repeaters are in the various uh, uh, counties around here. Yeah, let me see if I can figure out where the, I can't see this very good. Uh, here's, here's us, uh, the repeater here for Copper's Cove, paid by the CRA, Copper's Cove repeater, right there, which happens to be in my house, by the way, in my garden shed right now. It's going to move to a better place shortly. Uh, there's one in Las Passas, there's one up in Mix, there's a, up one up in Gatesville, Temple, Colleen, and, and most anybody running around here with a, with a handy talkie would be able to talk through that repeater to anybody in the area. So as you can see, that is a great multiplier. Yeah. No, the, the, the repeater right now, the Copper's Cove Repeater Club, Code Repeater Association. There were two repeaters, VHF and UHF, are right now in my in my shed. <coughs> Hopefully, around the end of next month or sooner, they're going to move over to the city communication site, which is on that big tower next to the water tower that says Copper's Cove on it. That's up over top of Oval Tree Gap. That's about 250 yards from from my house. So it's not going to move, but a quarter of a mile that way. But it's going to be. 180 feet higher, which is higher is better. Get more, more coverage. We're really, we're really looking forward to that. That's going to be a big improvement in our, uh, in our coverage area. Okay, we're running out of time here. So that CW and voice. Next thing to is digital. Well, not really. You know, what is digital? You know, digital says you're sending information instead of using your voice. You're sending it with some other. In the, in the real in information theory, they're called symbols. In, 
the symbols can be frequencies, they can be um, dots and dashes, they can be ones and zeros, which is normally what we use. Um, but I, I, I contend that Morse code was a digital mode. Signal on, signal off. And intelligence was encoded in that to where you had a message. So that's, that's um, what I call the first digital mode. It was like the first texting system back in the early 1900s. Next thing that came along was radio teletype because sending Morse code takes a long time. Being on voice takes some time. If you're if you're running like a shelter, let's say there was an emergency flood or something, and this this room became a emergency shelter for hundreds of people in the area, and we needed to get a list of names of the people that were in the shelter to maybe the state operations center so that they could coordinate, you know, with families or or you know, get food or whatever. Anyway, there's forms where you have, you know, you want to send the names of 100 people to someplace. Well, you can do that on voice, but it's hard, especially with a lot of names and pronunciations, and you pretty much have to spell each one, you know, phonetically. It takes a long time, and it's prone to errors. So you really want to form a form of written communications, typewritten or uh, teletype, or, and that's why radio teletype, the recall RTTY came up, because that was like a typewriter, some of us remember typewriters, some are too young to remember back in those old mechanical days of, of uh, pushing the keys. But it's a way to get written information down into a form where it can be rapidly and efficiently sent somewhere else. And of course, ham radio operators started using that right after it was invented too. And then in the 70s and 80s, computers came around, personal computers. I got my first one.